Welcome to the International Cinematography Guild IATSC Local 600 panel, The Many Dimensions of Camera Prep. I'm Michael Chambliss. I'm uh, one of the business reps for the local, and my specialty focus area is uh, uh, new technology and uh, the intersection of new technology and the craft of cinematography. Um, our panel this morning, we're taking on camera prep because production centers around the camera. After all, we don't make radio, we make movies and TV. And most of the time, the camera crew's work happens in plain sight. But some of the most important work, ensuring that the productions get off to a smooth start and you know are just ready for every call, happens hidden away in prep rooms at the camera house. This panel is about pulling back the curtain on that process. And, uh, and it's a process that too often goes unappreciated and is more and more frequently being cut short. The big way, a broad way to think about this is to think of the camera team as part of a production's flight crew. And imagine as uh, you start taxiing down the runway, how do you think a passenger might feel about learning that some of the flight checks were left undone? And that's really the point that we're trying to make here. We're fortunate today to have some serious experts in the process of camera prep lead us through some of what they do, why they do it, and who should be involved. We're gonna be focusing on camera prep for scripted productions, and that'll include feature films, episodic series, and commercials. Unscripted is an entirely different beast, and that's gonna be the subject of a different panel. Uh, so anyhow, to uh, uh, begin introducing our panelists, uh, Jane Fleck. Uh, Jane is a digital imaging technician. She approaches the craft from the perspectives of being a storyteller, visual artist, and animator with a bent towards cartoons, as well as having spent years as an editor, climbing her way up through national TV commercials, music videos, and TV shows, and on to features and network productions. She's also produced documentaries for PDF, PBS, uh, produced an unscripted pilot, and has indie projects that have won regional and national awards. Her credits as a DIT include About Last Night, Gentrified, and Girls' Room. Uh, Asia uh, Arida is a first camera assistant who comes from Los, An uh, Los Angeles family of Latino artists. Asia received her BFA in cinematography from Columbia College, Hollywood, and had the honor of being accepted into AFI's first year of the Cinematography Introductory Intensive for Women in 2018. She got her break as an AC from her mentor, director Charles Hain, on the feature film Angel's Perch that wrapped nine years ago today. Her credits include Dear White People, uh, season three, Gentrified, season two, and Death to 2020. Uh, coming from a film family, and uh, film industry family in Chicago, Larry Nielsen got his start as, par as a part-time projectionist in a local movie theater. And after having served in the U.S. Army, he settled in Seattle, where he got a job assembling dailies roles for commercials and local films. He jumped at the chance to be an assistant cameraman and moved to Los Angeles, where he built his resume on hit TV shows and feature films. He met Mario Fiore, ASC, in 2001 and worked as his key first assistant for 20 years. His credits include Avatar, The Island, and Shutter Island. Uh, Aaron Peacott is a digital imaging technician who started off his career in the Guild as a loader. And after, uh, after pivoting from early experiences in editorial and broadcast graphics, his, his 11 years of, as a DJ for features, TV series, and commercials have been a period of constant study for him, retraining and then teaching as the digital imaging technology has evolved. He views the mission of the DIT as helping the director of photography achieve their vision by mastering and using all available technology. Aaron's credits as a DIT include the Terminal List, Blind Spotting, and Strange Angel. So, to, to really get the panel going, I think it's let's lay some broad groundwork. 
Uh, there are, you know, several areas of prep. Some are handled by the lead camera assistant, and others are handled by the DIT. Uh, let's kick off about talking about what your prep check, yeah, blah, what your prep checklist looks like from each of those perspectives and what that entails. Anybody can just jump in. All right, I, I guess I'll start then. Um, one of the I used to carry a checklist of of what prep was, and then as more and more preps happen, you kind of forget that checklist and you start focusing in a specific area for yourself that you want. So my biggest concern when I show up at a prep is one, the camera bodies themselves, and then two, the lenses. When it comes down to the accessories because I focus so much on the body and I focus so much on what the lenses do, I require my second assistant to go through all of the accessories and make sure all of that is in, in line to what we're doing. Because I'll spend, literally I will spend, if I have a week, two weeks of prep, I will spend one week just going through lenses and projecting and making sure that they come up and focus, or not so much focus, but perform the way I want them to perform as per what my DP or production is requiring. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me just ask a quick follow up. What are the what are the issues that you look at with lenses? Well, the biggest thing is is what I can tell you in the digital age, you can throw a lens up on a camera, and then you can look at your thirteen oh three, and then you can put a chart out there and and set your Preston and focus it up and say, okay, it's good, it works. And you're looking at a small monitor. You're not looking at the big picture, which basically is a twenty foot screen. So when you take a lens in the back and you project it, you'll actually see those corners, the things that you won't see on your 1303. And then even your DIT, if your DIT is using a 17 inch or a 21 inch, how matter big it is, they may not see that same issue on the corner with that lens, which would be a matter of if the lens is bending, if it's warping, if it's going out of, if the focus fall off is different on that side, if the focus fall off is different on the bottom. If a lens does not come up at a specific distance, it's not going to come up at infinity. So if you're doing a, if you're in Los Angeles and you're doing a shot of the Santa Monica mountains and you're on a 35 millimeter lens and you set the lens to infinity, it may look sharp in your 1303, but on a 20 inch screen, it is not going to be sharp. And that's where you're going to have your problems. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Asia, uh, you know, what's, what's your approach going into prep? Um, yeah, it would be looking at the lenses and stuff also, but I also concentrate on like my checklist is going through what DP needs also to see that I have all the equipment that he's going to use for the entire or she's going to use for the entire job. Um, so I'd start with the body and then start going through the accessories and see how everything works. Um, looking at the lenses first is always important because then that really makes a difference on what accessories you're actually going to use because lenses come in every shape and size. And sometimes, you know, you don't get an exact set. So a lot of the, a lot of my checklist is making sure everything's going to work together also on top of making sure all the lenses actually look sharp and everything. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of making sure that we have all the tech that's needed and that all the tech and that all the tech is running and it's gonna nothing's gonna short out anything and the body itself the sensor is all good um, so it's a lot of that kind of stuff on the checklist no, thanks so so Jane what what is it that you look at well usually the the camera team, the, the and this is not a problem, this is we split up the work. The camera team makes sure that the camera is set up to the spec that post or whoever has determined what format we're shooting, check all the lenses, you know. Um, obviously, a DIT looks at some of that as well, but typically when I go in, I ask for all the cards to start out with, and I ask for a clip, once they get a camera, put together enough to give me a clip. I get one clip in prep and I go ahead and run it through the entire process 
to get it to post. I prefer a short clip, like five or six seconds, so it isn't that big a piece of data. If there's color to be put on it, we put the LUT on and then transcode and send a transcode off to post to make sure that what we're delivering to them, both the original file and the transcode is correct for what the specs are and what, they're, what they want to see. And obviously, there's always an uh, issue of having another set of eyes to make sure, like Larry was talking about, that the you know there's nothing missing, that we're not getting vignetting on the edges of the frame, or you know, especially when you're using vintage lenses with a large format camera, which gives you an astounding look. You can also run into problems with vignetting with some of the. Uh, you know, the wider lenses because they weren't designed to project on that big of a sensor. And so that you kind of, everybody works together to make sure you don't miss that and get out in the field and go, uh oh, this lens isn't going to work. So, so, so Aaron, what do you, what do you have to add to this? And, and by the way, for everybody, it is Aaron Pico. I, I mispronounced his last name when I started off. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, all good things I'm hearing. Um, and um, just want to say I'm honored to be a part of this panel, uh, first and foremost. So thanks for having me. Um, prep is the time when you need to put all the pieces together and make them work like they're going to be on set. So you want to, I try to use my days of prep to get to a place where all the cameras and all the radio frequencies and all the transmitters and everything is playing just like they said, okay, two cameras, let's go. And um, because if you can't get it to work at the prep, you're not going to get it to work on the first day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, productions aren't spending that much money when you're on a prep. So I try to ask for as many prep days as like the ACs get. Um, I think that I can fill any prep day with, <laughs> with as much work. Um, there is no such thing as too long of a prep for me. Um, and, um, it's it, the real money is going to be spent when you're on, when you're filming. So when you're filming is not the right time to be troubleshooting and, mm -hmm. uh, and getting things ready and wondering if something works, you want to know a hundred percent. So mm -hmm. just without going into any details about what I do at prep, that's kind of my mindset is get everybody and everything ready for ready to say action yeah and it's and it's a big one of the big things about prep is that uh you have you have access to easier access to the resources uh to work through any issues uh you know you're not under the gun you're not on the set so if you need to get a hold of somebody uh, if you're at the camera house, you have uh, uh, the experts at the uh, 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 rental facility that can uh, uh, respond to issues that you may be running into, this sort of thing. Um, one, another question just on the overall sh shape of prep is who should be involved and what contribution do they make? I personally... I believe the entire camera department should on, honestly be there for prep. The entire camera department needs to be uh, available to, or we will fight to have the entire camera department, but sometimes it's not always given to us. Um, but that's the best way to make sure that everything goes smoothly and that the first day we're not doing any kind of, you know, technical, like, uh, figuring things out on the day and spending mm -hmm. time just trying to get things running like Teradex and stuff like that. So everybody in the camera department should be at prep. I, I, I'd agree with that as well. I think that they, uh, it's essential, especially if you're doing color on set, that the DP be involved during the prep. And that's often, often problematic because they're off uh, scouting locations and working on lighting and doing things that are going to affect the first day of production. So, you know, getting everybody there and getting all the pieces working smoothly before you have that first day of trying to shoot is a really good idea. Can't hear you, Aaron. Whoops, uh, Aaron's, we've lost audio on Aaron. 
Okay, so maybe while that is getting itself worked out, um, uh, let me let me bounce on to the next one. And Larry really started to talk about this, but the second AC has a fairly you, you know unique role in prep, and it's going to change between uh, uh, between firsts about how that work is assigned, but. Um, uh, you know what is the what is the role of 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 the second AC? The second AC next to the loader, MIs have two of the most important jobs. Not only do they run the set itself, but when it comes to the equipment, they're the ones that are tracking basically everything you have, keeping the paperwork for all your stuff. Um, usually what I'll do is, is if I find a problem with something, I'll say, hey, we need to get this. They write it down on the board. And I may come back 20 minutes later and say, hey, did we ever get this piece of equipment? And usually my second AC is the one that said, yes, we got it or no, we don't have it. And I'm like, follow up on it because I'm actually, be realistically, I'm busy doing a bunch of other things. They either I'm coordinating with the DP, talking to production, uh, talking to the house about the lenses, the bodies, what equipment we're going to need when and there. And it's just like my second is the one who is managing all the rest of the stuff that I'm going through and pretty much labeling all the equipment to make sure that it's not getting mix, mixed up. B cameras available. They know what all their accessories are. It's all color coded. The second assistant has a really big responsibility when it comes to prepping. Asia, do you have something to add to that? No, that was going to say the same thing. They're, they have the biggest responsibility because without them, we'd be so disorganized. Um, they, with we, the second ACs um, are not only going through extra accessories that we can't really get to while we're doing like technical things on the body and the lenses, but they're also making sure that everything's organized as far as like schedule. Like if we have other things scheduled and we need help uh, arranging where things need to be and organizing that they are good at just being hey, well i'll take over and help you with that with scheduling and stuff so but they are also going through like almost all of the other equipment that we're we're working with also so yeah those things so so aaron and uh do we have back? You, back? you are back okay <laughs> <laughs> um I, I was just gonna say right off the beginning that um that i agreed with asia 100 percent, and that is that why would you have just half of the team or half of a team that's going to be working together for potentially months um, left out of the equation at the beginning or only involved in a fraction when, you know, you need to create that rapport. And also there's that much work to be done. Um, like Larry and uh, Asia were saying, like the seconds are super important or, you know, to the, the, the loader is super important. There's so much stuff that has to, these days with like different hard drive types and media types and speed types and dealing with heat and power issues and where are they going to set up and, and the utility has all kinds of labeling and running around to do and, and securing different gear. It's every single person is just as important and I think they need to be there each day too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it also has a chance to um, make sure that the workflows are all together between the, the different members of the, of the department. You know, it's a ch it's a chance for uh, uh, again more relaxed communication. You know, once you're on the set, you're focused on the shot, and this is this is a chance for uh, uh, a lot of the background organization uh, uh, to take place. Um, when you going into prep, uh, we, we've talked some about what it is that you do. How is it that you know what to do? What what do you what do you need to know before prep begins, and how do you go about getting that information? It's really important um, to start off a dialogue with um, the production manager, production coordinator, all the whole production team, with the post team. Uh, this is from a DIT's perspective, anyway. Uh, and of course, the DP. Uh, what artist? What are we trying to do artistically, and what are we trying to deliver exactly? And um, I won't go. I, it doesn't make sense showing up to a prep unless you know those things first. So all those dialogues have to be had days or possibly weeks or a couple of weeks ahead of time. 
Mm -hmm. Opening that, opening those lines of of you know communication and dialogue, and before you even ever get to the prep. Yeah, I, I'd add one other thing to what you just said, which is, I'm always because I have a post background, I'm always very proactive about reaching out to the post department and talking about the delivery specs and exactly what they want when we go into prep it is ideal that you get all of that worked out and do a, a delivery of some sort to post before you get into production to make sure that the uh, shoot from camera to editing is just very smooth. And if you don't have that, it can create uh, serious problems at the beginning of production, which it's best to avoid. That is the whole reason for prep is to avoid not having it all worked out ahead of time. Larry, what speak to operators? Go ahead. Go ahead, Asia. Um, I'll also speak to the operators and the sound mixer before we start prep also to see what they need to require from us mm -hmm. to build the package in a way that's good for them. I think so. So, so Larry, I, I was going to ask you, um, the process of what is your process? You know, uh, uh, you're handed a script. Uh, how, what do you what do you go through then to start to uh, figure out what your what the camera department is going to be needing and how it gets scheduled? That's interesting because it actually I can't sugarcoat this because this is how it is today. Is Usually you're, you, you find out your, your director of photography has got a job. Your director of photography is given anywhere from a month to three months of prep. And while that prep is happening, you've not made your deal yet. And you're still waiting and waiting and waiting. And then finally your deal gets made and you make that important question, is, what are we shooting? And then it comes down to, well, we haven't decided. You don't know if you're shooting anamorphic. You don't know if you're shooting spherical. You don't know what rental house you're going through yet. So you're playing the waiting game. And a lot of times it's like maybe a week to a couple of days before you actually start your prep is where you find out what you're doing, whether it's gonna be anamorphic. And then my favorite thing is, is when you find out it's gonna be anamorphic and you say, okay, has anyone called a rental house to get these anamorphic lenses yet? And they're like, no, no, we're gonna do that later today, only to find out that that rental house doesn't have anamorphic lenses because they've been booked on other shows for two or three months already. And so productions need to reach out early to get to these rental houses and say, this is what we're doing and how we're doing it. At that time, you hope that when you start, there is some kind of schedule or production schedule that is set up and that you get your time to sit down with the director of photography to figure out what the scheduling is already, already, already is because there may be a night exterior at the dock and you can look at the script and say, okay, night exterior to dock, schedule says he's in the water. Okay, do I need a water housing? Do I need to get this? So you have to sit down with your DP at some time and discuss what they've discussed on the scout so you can start making sure that you have all the equipment you need, A, for that particular day when you do it, or B, throughout the whole run of the show, whatever you're gonna need. And you'll get into these situations too, and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead where Production will say, well, what do we need this for? And you're like, well, this is what's called for. And they're like, yeah, but we don't need it the whole run of the show. So now you've got to make deals with a piece of equipment that you actually may need the whole run of the show, but production doesn't want to pay for it. So then you have to figure if it's going to be on a, a day player schedule where you still keep it and pay for it as you use it. Or if it's something that you can say, okay, we don't need and we can pick it up at a specific date. And those are, those are some of the realities of what is out there right now on features. You don't know what you're gonna get until you get in there. And then even while you're in there, it's changing, constantly changing. So you've gotta be able to adapt and fly even in the prep. Um, you may not need a 100 millimeter lens. You may need two 100 millimeter lenses. You may not need a specific zoom. You may need three of those zooms. You never know. And it keeps constantly changing. So it's kind of really hard to go in with a base game plan nowadays into a prep. There's so, 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 so to pivot just a little bit, uh, 
One of the things that gets mixed up often is our prep days and test days. And, you know, I, I wanted folks to talk a little bit about why a prep day is not a test day and why a test day is not a prep day. I, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Okay. A, a lot of my career is anamorphic lenses, and a lot of my career for the anamorphic lenses is through Panavision. And with, with Panavision lenses and anamorphic, you have different series of lenses, and each lens has a different characteristic. And you can go back with the lens technicians, and you can do what's called vertical adjustments, which will move the lenses, uh, the, fo the two focusing glasses in the center that go like this. You can actually move them apart a little bit and shift the most focus point to the outside, which will actually flatten a lens. And when I say flatten, it's because an anamorphic lens, when you see it is curved, and you can actually kind of straighten that out a bit. So what ends up happening is, and it's a classic example, because this did happen on a job I was doing, where they wanted to do a test. And we didn't have the lenses because one lenses were out, two lenses were coming in, three lenses were being adjusted the way I wanted to be adjusted, and we didn't really have a full package. So you go out and you do this test while all these other lenses are being worked on and you're using the lenses that you're not gonna take on a job. And they look at dailies a couple of days later and they go, oh my God, this looks like crap. What is this assistant doing? So it's test days take away from the actual prep of what you're doing. And they also can help to make you look bad, so. Yeah, uh, you don't have the freedom of mobility at a at a test that you do on a prep. So, yeah, when you're testing, your your prepping is either on hold, like if you're doing a test in the middle of your prep days, or uh, prep is over. Um, because from my from my perspective, it's a shoot day. You know, all the monitors are working, the cameras are working, the lights are working. You know, we're shooting. Basically, it's, we're not testing cables and we're not calibrating monitors. That time has passed. The um, one of one of the things that also gets uh, can be a confusing uh, conversation with production sometimes is um, you've checked out the equipment. The equipment is prep prepped. Now you've shipped it, and there's the need for prep time on the location then after the equipment has been shipped. Why is that? Uh, it's because our equipment um, built, fully built, can't fit in any of the actual cases they came in originally. You're doing a lot of consolidation oh. and stuff uh, in order to make the process on the day faster. Uh, it's never going to be completely set up or built the way you need it to when we're actually shooting. So you're going to need to organize and get your stuff together as soon as it ships in and lands on the first day. And that first day is always going to be a lot of getting everything together in the morning. It's just always a, you know, it's never going to be the quickest morning of the shoot. It's always going to be a little bit of getting things together and checking stuff. <laughs> Yeah, well, and and isn't that also an opportunity to um, uh, for the uh, local hires to start to get to know the package? You know, because that's the other thing that comes in on that is that you know very often you'll have people that you know uh, they haven't been part of the larger prep, and uh, uh, all of a sudden you know they've they've got to get on the page. True, and it, the other part of it also is because so, sometimes not all the gear shows up. <laughs> you'll have, you'll get, you might have one or two cases that don't show up and you can't start shooting because one of those cases might be the body. So you're going to need those extra days, a couple extra days when you get to the location. And yeah, the other, the biggest one is, is if you're using a local crew in that area, they need to get familiarized with the package. They need to get familiarized with the gear and they need to feel comfortable with it. Thanks. So, so, um, and and this will this will be a round robin one. And this one this one's actually going to going to be some fun because um, uh, talk a little bit about I'd, I'd love uh, 
uh, to be able to share some stories about issues on the set that could have been avoided with good prep. This is the, the what could possibly happen question. The probably the the um, thing that happens most often for commercial DITs or maybe younger commercial DITs is um, hard drive problems, and that's by not um, not really doing the necessary prep of getting the hard drives um, and testing the speeds with the workflow. Um, a lot of DITs you'll hear or young DITs or, or uh, loaders, you'll hear them say, well, I just got dropped off these hard drives and they're really slow and I didn't have any time to prep and stuff like that. But um, I found that, that that part of the job, you really just need to be proactive at the beginning and let, you know, as soon as you get the job, if you're going to be doing the downloading, you need to let production know what's going to work and what's not going to work and when you need the drives. And if they're saying nothing is available, you know, you need to work on sort, you know, outsourcing, outsourcing your media and, and getting it right. I don't yeah, know if I, I have a specific story because it's happened so many times. <laughs> it <laughs> happens here at all the time. Like production gave me these slow drives. So, well, yeah. Well, 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 Jane, Jane, I know that you've worked, um, uh, you've handled some very large data productions. <laughs> you know, productions that have a had a bit. large data flow. And um, how does, what happens there? Because, you know, and, and some of the issues that can come up with camera cards, et cetera. Oh, um, absolutely what Aaron said. I, you know, I, to, to a quick story, I got on a commercial and they gave me two Lacey Ruggeds, which are slow. And we were shooting 6K and one was 500 gigabytes and the other was one terabyte. And they had no concept that they weren't going to be A, fast enough or B, big enough. And I ended up putting it to shuttle drives that I bring to set and they used my shuttles instead of theirs. But in the biggest sense, um, some of the things that can go wrong, uh, when you get into big data shows, now we're talking 4K, 20, 20 odd cameras, shooting everything, you know, wall to wall and a lot of cards and S by S cards for me are the biggest concern when we're shooting F 55s 4k, they work great. The cameras work great, but the cards have seen a lot of usage and you get in 150, 200 cards from a rental house. You need to go in the prep through every single card and make sure that the right speed and read speed is correct so that when you start shooting, you don't have card failures. And on shows where they come in and they say, you don't have a prep, you just have to, you know, download, you just have to download the data. I love that. Um, you know, okay, so we're doing 15 terabytes a day and you can have camera failure, uh, card failure in the camera while shooting that makes the data unrecoverable. That unfortunately on one show, that I was brought on where they said, you don't need a prep day. We were only shooting, you know, I got on there, they started shooting and one of the cards failed in the camera and they lost that footage. And I flagged it at the time. And the next season, when we came back, they gave me the prep day to go through every, every card and we had no problems. If you, you know, if you check the media, the camera media, uh, these S by S cards are the number one culprit because they've just seen so many right read cycles. And for those people who are not in the tech end, most cards only have about 1,100 right read cycles before they really start to show serious degradation and fail. And the write speeds get slower, the read speeds get slower, and eventually they get to the point where the camera will be recording to them and they will fail. And so it's essential to do that ahead of time. And obviously then there are there's, if you don't get a prep day, you can't make sure that things like the readers work or, you know, um, if it's an un codex readers mostly are very robust once they start working, but they can be a pain to set up. And also destination drives can be a pain to set up if you get a particular brand and you have to run special software to be able to run it. You know, all of this stuff can be worked on, but the most stressful thing in the world is to get on set and have them hand you a pile. Here, here's a pile of gear to integrate into your DIT setup and have it not, some of it not work. And that's, it's essential to have a prep day to make sure that it all does 
work and you can hand them back and say, this reader is not working. We need a different one. Or this ca these cards aren't fast enough. We need different ones. Um, Michael, I just wonder if since we're kind of on the, the DIT pet, um, process, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Absolutely. Okay, sorry. Um, if I can just share my screen and show my checklist now, maybe? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. and we'll come Go. back to the, the horror stories of prep. Um, so hopefully it'll let me do it now. Let's see. Do you see my prep checklist? Yes. Okay, so this is something that, um, this is a, um, an outline that was not created by me specifically. I have taken it and run with it. The person who created Um, and so it's checking out the media, checking out everything with the cameras, you know, checking with posts, checking out the hard drives and the media, you know, it's, 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 it's a way for me to make sure that, um, I literally checked all the boxes, but it also, I find, um, it helps me focus on the day and actually get things done quicker because I can go, okay, done, moving on, done, moving on. And I mean, I do this on commercials, you know, one day commercials, and I do this on, you know, six month long episodics. So I just keep this handy and, um, and basically reset it for each job. And, and I think it's, it's really helpful to me. And maybe if, um, you know, people are just getting started out, maybe they might consider doing the same. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now after it does that. So, yeah prep checklist, big, uh, big plus for me. There you go. And I, I think that it's interesting that you send that to production as well. You know, it, right. Yeah. I'll send the completed copy to like the AC, the DP, the friend, the production manager, and just to kind of show my work because it's important to do the work, but it's important for others to understand that that got done as well. Um, they're not wondering like, Hmm, was there dirt on the sensor? Like, Nope. Check, checked it off. I looked at it. I, sometimes I can be seen like I'm, I'm running around like a madman at prep because I'm trying to get so much stuff done, but you know, what's that guy doing? <laughs> okay. At the end, here's my list. This is what I did. And on jobs too, where it's, it's been helpful where I'm not offered a prep. Maybe it's a one day commercial. Maybe it's a, you know, one Alexa mini. And for some reason they think that doesn't warrant a prep. I'll just say, okay, here's my prep checklist. It's blank. Um, but just so you know, here's all the things that won't get done. See you on set. <laughs> you know, if I decide to take the job without a prep, which is not typical, but, but sometimes when they see all that, they go, oh, okay. I didn't understand. So have a prep day. So something like that can help you get that prep day. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that's actually an interesting seg to a question on how does prep scale? You know, all of you guys have worked on commercials. You've all worked on episodic series. You, you know, you've worked on larger features. How, how does, does prep really scale from one to the other? You know, because it seems uh, uh, a feature, they'll, it's a larger production. They'll tend to give you a little more time on a commercial. Uh, it, can, it, it can come down to, gee, why, why can't we just have the gear dropped off? You know, you'll see it in the camera truck. You you bring up a great story and or a great point, and I have a really interesting story. Is is I was on one of those big budget films where we were shooting. It was film. We were shooting Super Thirty Five Two Four O Three Perf, and we had scheduled an additional camera. And they decided that they didn't want to give the additional first assistant we were bringing in a prep day. So the morning that the camera showed up, we quickly went through it and found out that the ground glass in the camera was 185 and it was a four perf camera, which rendered that camera and that crew useless for that day. So it was money wasted by not giving an assistant a prep to go in there and look at that camera. No, I, I've, I've, I've actually got my own story on that where uh, there was a uh, ground glass and uh, gate mix up and uh, production ended up spending a 
a considerable sum of money on optical repositioning of the frame. You know, I've yeah. horror stories from like lower budgeted and basically just explaining to production. I think it's very important, especially on lower budgeted jobs to make or to give producers a cause and effect for what's going to happen when they start c cutting away at certain equipment and stuff. So we've had situations where they're like, well, we need to get rid of this and this. We need to get rid of monitors. Monitors, for some reason, is like the first thing they want to start cutting away at, which is crazy because it's like the thing everybody is needing, like makeup department, uh, lighting department, everyone needs a monitor. And of course, producers look as like, oh, well, let's start cutting away at the things you don't need for the camera, the monitors. And I'm not going to say which project it was, but we had a situation where we had to tell the producers, you know, don't, don't cut anything. And they were saying, no, 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 we have to cut all the monitors. We're going to do a online uh, thing that everybody can look at um, so that they can just, I don't know, like look in on the tear deck on the cube that never works out on the situation on, on the day. It never works out for all the departments to really look into what they need to see. Um, and so they cut all of our monitors and we got there on the first day and the director walked in and I guess after we talked with the producers, they didn't even talk to the director about it. And the director walked in and was like, where's my monitor? Where's this? Where's my handheld? Where's all this stuff? And we were like, you, you could see our emails. We told them exactly what was going to happen. We told them, you, you know, every department needed this, this, and this. And here we are. This is what happened. <laughs> and so then they got in real trouble. The producers themselves got in trouble with the director because of it. But it's very important to have that paper trail with productions, especially in budget situation explaining if you're going to do cut our stuff out this is what's going to happen on the first day you're going to be missing this and this and this for each department and yeah so yeah so in other words you know and i think the point there is very good about being being clear uh uh, uh where you're where you see compromises coming being clear about raising your hand so that folks understand that you saw them coming and at least then you can say, well, you know, we, we, we advised you that this might be an issue, you know, as it comes up. That, that, that kind of communications is an important step. Um, we've gone through a lot of, uh, we've gone through a lot of technical rollover and there are, there continue to be new layers of technology uh, being laid on the process. Uh, network cameras, uh, you know, offset streaming has, uh, you know, become, you know, uh, a very big deal. Um, how, how is this changing? Uh, how is prep evolving? And I think this is both for uh, 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 both for assistants and DITs. You know, it's it's you know, take a look at your prep a few years ago. Take a look at your prep now. It seems to me that a lot of things are being added. I, I would say one of the biggest things that I've noticed, and the relationship between the digital imaging technician and the first AC has changed quite a bit. Um, it used to be that we really didn't have a relationship. They were on the set and we we relied on them for um, being our second eyes, basically. Now we find ourselves more involved with them as far as the whole post-production access is, a, aspect is concerned. We find ourselves having to lobby for them at times in order getting cards because we know that we're going to be on a location and we find that we're going to be three days out from dailies and how many more cards do we got to get to help them make their job a little easier. And one of the biggest things I've noticed too is, is not in different lighting setups. The, um, if the camera is recording in a raw image and you're transmitting out a raw image, a LUT is becoming one of the most important things that you as an assistant are going to need for your monitor at the same time so that you're not seeing the raw image and you're not getting a delay. So your relationship with the DIT becomes even tighter. Also, when it comes to the aspect of, yes, like you're saying, um, you know, there's this new system coming up. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of people are familiar with it. 
where the recordings, where sound and picture are being logged and sent right to editorial as you're shooting. And so when it comes to what gets lost, they look at both the view, the DIT and the first AC, as to why didn't we get that image or what happened here or what does it look this way? So in that, in that aspect, the, the evolution of the relationship with the first assistant and the DIT is completely changing, where we are kind of coming one together. So. I think um, one of the newer things that DITs are being looked at to take care of is RF management on sets. And that involves uh, video transmission, that's communication as far as um, focus and iris remote control. Um, you know, it could be uh, streaming video over IP. Um, it could be, um, you know, as far as the like wireless video, it operates on the 5G spectrum. So go downtown in LA and set up four cameras with a, you know, four Teradex and watch them not work because the 5G spectrum is just completely crowded and, and, and has interference all over it. Um, and there's ways to combat those issues, but um, I think DITs are just starting to kind of wake up like, oh, we're the, we're the technician and we need to be the ones to, you know, basically run the set as far as that goes and take that on. So of course that starts even before the prep with phone calls to, or emails to um, like the dimmer board op and, and let's talk about their wireless um, setup, what's gonna be on the stages, what to expect. Um, what kind of Wi-Fi is going to be on the stages? What are our locations like? Can I call ahead to locations and have them shut off all their <laughs> Wi-Fi receivers, you know, or Wi-Fi transmitters? Um, so yeah, RF management I think is is one way that the DIT job is is evolving, and so certainly that will affect the prep. Um, sometimes we're being asked to stream video, but. Um, more often, I see that's a um, that's a VTR thing. That's a video playback thing. Uh, if there's not video playback, then DITs are are being asked to uh, send the video over IP. And that takes some setup. That's setting up hardware and software and testing and networks and all that stuff. So yeah. So so Jane, what what do you think the impact of cloud workflows? Uh, are going to be in terms of uh, the future shape of uh, prep? Oh, you know, I, I'd have to say my experience with cloud workflows is very limited. Uh, one of the things that I have run into, and this was some, um, uh, when I have done the streaming process that Aaron was just describing, um, the, the Wi-Fi and connectivity, especially on location, can be very problematic. And I have my experience with cloud workflows because a lot of my work is location work uh, has been very limited, mainly because the connectivity isn't there to be able to get to the cloud with the data. And you know, you have to have very specialized hardware to be able to upload and get it to a cloud server. And that's not something that I'm asked to do very often just because it hasn't been, it hasn't worked out when I've done it in the past, not for me, but that the, there's limitations to the technology. And if you're out in the middle of downtown, like Aaron said, or out in the hinterlands, you often don't have the connectivity to be able to send stuff to the cloud immediately. I had the opportunity on the last um, feature that I did to do that. We were, we were uploading everything to, well, through a company called Frame.io. Um, with Teradex system, but we were inside of a studio and it worked out really well. Um, but yeah, it, even in the studio, there was hiccups here and there. So I can't imagine trying to take it up by this, you know, uh, environments. Like it, it's going to be very difficult. I need to get those working out like downtown LA. Oops, sort of, sort of, sort of faded there, Asia. The um, uh, uh, 
Let me circle back on, on and I brought this up at the beginning. Uh, and this is just like opinions uh, coming out because it's like, why do you think allowances for prep time keep coming under pressure? Uh, uh, is it really, is it exclusively budget or is there kind of an impression that because stuff is digital, it's automatically going to be faster and th there's less stuff to look at? Uh, or, or that if there is a problem, it can be fixed in post. I don't know. You know, what, uh, uh, let's go around the room. What are, what are your feelings about that? It's hard to know exactly why, uh, because it's not like they're going to tell you why. You know, the people that hire you aren't going to go, here's why I'm not giving you a prep day, unless it's when they say, oh, it's just one camera, one day shoot. And I'm going, well, do you want to get the shot or not? Like, why, why do you care more when it's a multiple, you know? But uh, they're not going to, you know, it's, I think it's usually my feeling that I get is if you're not offered a prep or a proper prep, it's that they don't know what you do. They don't care what you do, um, but they just don't want to give you, you know, why give money to it? They don't know why. So mm -hmm. don't care. Not their problem. Moving on. Give it to the give it give a prep day to the first and that's it. And nobody else needs to be there. Yeah, I, I would non technical I, person trying to tell you how to prep technical gear. Yeah, I, I'd second that. The the biggest reason that people don't want to pay for a prep day is budgetary and also that there's no understanding of what you do in that prep day and the risk that they're taking by not having one. And it's it's one of those deals where, especially if it's like a one or two camera shoot, they're looking at it and they're going, oh, you know, you just plug into your computer and there it is, right? You know, and they don't realize that there's any options for things to go wrong. And often those type of shoots are the most stressful where you get on set and you run into the things that you would have run into if you had had a prep day. And, you know, that's what makes you old before your time as a DIT, it's like just struggling to get completely organized and everything there. And we do it. That's the amazing thing is that 90% of the time we do it and it, they go, well, yeah, see, you didn't need a prep day. And it's a self-perpetuating thing. And when it doesn't work out for one reason or another, then they go, they don't see it as a lack of preparation. They see it as a a uh, sign that there is, you know, you should have been able to do it. And that's that's very scary and very hard as a DIT because our job is to make sure, you know, you only have to do it perfectly every time, every day, because if you don't, the consequences are horrible. And I've found that most of the time it's just people not understanding. It's I agree with you guys about it being like a misunderstanding of our job. And most of the time when it's budgetary, they'll cut the second from the prep or the DIT from the prep. Um, but the, at least the budgetary type situation, they actually understand that they do need someone prepping a camera before it comes to the set. But the people that won't give a prep are the ones that just don't know what the consequences are, which is when I would give them examples of this is what's gonna happen. Your consequences are these things. It's a whole list of things that could, could go wrong and waste their money and their time. Hopefully the prep checklist will help with some of that situational, but still, if you send them that, then it's like, at least now you know what you're going to get or not going to get. Spell it out. Yes. I, I believe it's a budgetary thing and i believe it's also because when they they show up on set and they look at a monitor and they see it's all working it's like out of the box they expect it to work and don't understand that it takes time to make it to work and or make it work and so they look at a monitor they see okay it looks okay it looks great fantastic it's instant gratification so why are we going to be paying extra for something that's going to come out of the box and work and not even know it so it's i believe it's completely budgetary so yeah, and then budgetary and awareness, you know, on the things. So, so we've been we've been going for a bit here. Um, uh, I haven't looked at the chat at all. I'm I'm wondering if we have. Uh, uh, do we have any audience questions? Can we, we have any audience? 
I haven't seen any audience. <laughs> Has anyone there? <laughs> Hello. See, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I'm 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 looking for feedback from uh, uh, feedback from our hosts here. <laughs> Whoops! I'm hearing something in the background. Aha, something's happening. We see you, we don't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, my question is more so, it sounds like you guys talk a lot about two to six month uh, shoots on a larger prep. How do you guys um, condense it, I guess, to like the one day preps? I get that a lot where it's like a one to four day commercial or music video. Um, and what do you guys change and what do you guys cut down to a short and shoot? Work faster. It all needs to be done anyway. <laughs> it, yeah, it, I mean, one day, I mean, two day commercials or music videos when you're prepping those, yeah, you're only going to get one day to do it. Uh, I like to fight to get my second there because the reality is, is that you're going to have everything the rental house has for that one camera you're going to have every little toy every little trick and you're going to need to be showing up there the minute the rental house opens and you're probably going to be keeping them there late and you need to make make the production aware of the fact that all these changes that are going to happen are just going to add time at the end of the day and if they want it done within a specific time then you're going to need two days or you're going to be on there until you're finished so and it's a terrible situation i've been there um one of my favorite stories about that was is we were doing this, doing this commercial, and I, it was at uh, one rental house company, and I went there to start prepping. And then so I start prepping the gear, and at about lunchtime, the director decides that he wants to use a specific set of lenses that the other rental house doesn't provide, and a completely different camera system. So now my job was to drive all the way across town in Los Angeles to start a prep at another rental house just for that commercial and it was ridiculous because i ended up spending i want to say a good 16 hours doing this prep so some things uh, some things might need to go by the wayside if you only have so much time and you only have two hands um some of the thing uh, one of the processes jane mentioned was um taking a recorded clip and basically sending it through the whole color pipeline and through transcoding and through the whole post process, you have one day to prep. You won't have time to do that. So, you know, at least I wouldn't, <laughs> not, not the full process. I mean, you'd be on, on set before you'd ever hear back from posts, like if it was okay or not or whatever. But, um, I don't know some of the, some of the things that, you know, maybe it might be a luxury of, a of a four or five day prep you just have to ax it from the one day. I mean, you have to kind of take the, the more luxury items, which is really hard to do. But like I said, uh, or like Larry said, bring in more hands or, um, you know, it's going to take, it's going to be a really, really long prep day to get it all done. I do have one more ad for you there. There are little tricks you can do as far as when you're prepping your lenses. And normally what I'll do is I'll run a tape and I'll check my lenses at 5, 10, and 15 feet. So instead of starting all back over from each lens, might be wise to start one lens, go 5, 10, 15 feet, put the next lens up, check it at 15, bring it back to 10, then 5. And then the next lens that you put up after that, check it at 5, then move it that way. That may help you go a little faster in checking your lenses. But it's also, I mean, you're going to change in those dynamics when you start getting to the wider lenses. You're going to want to bring the chart in closer than 5 feet. So, but that's kind of a general like, place to start and will kind of help you move quicker through your lenses. Do you have a question? Yeah. Right, I have another one. I'll go up to the next one. <laughs> you got it. I think go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, the other thing, and I work as like a first AC, so I guess my question is um, more towards uh, gear preference. Uh, how do you go about um, getting what you're looking for. My big thing is hand units. 
uh, versus like Preston and RE versions. Um, and I guess it, it goes for every department, but uh, how in prep does that change for you guys? And at what point do you start having a conversation with UPMs and whatnot um, about what you guys want on a personal uh, basis? Well, I think like the Preston, are you talking about like, like your, what handset you want to use, like a Preston or the WC4? I mean, the reality is, is it's, it shouldn't really be a concern of, pro, uh, of production because it's whatever you're comfortable with. It's whatever you, you want to use. They all rent basically for the same price. I mean, you're going to get a Preston for X amount of dollars a day, and you're going to get a WC4 for that same amount of money per day as, you know, using a, a city tape versus a, um, uh, uh, a light ranger. I mean, they all rent for the same amount of dollars. It's whatever your preference is. But I am going to say this, though, and this is something you need to be aware of. As you start getting into those bigger, bigger projects and you start working for different companies, they are going to require you to do certain things. If you work for Disney or Marvel, for instance, and you're doing a movie that's heavily on visual effects, they like the MDR-3. And the reason they like the MDR-3 is because there's a little dongle you can put in there which will record everything you're doing on your Preston handset. So if you're zooming, you're pulling focus, you're doing an iris change, that is all being stored on that little uh, USB drive with time code. So they know what you've done exactly when you've done it. So I hope that gives you an idea of kind of the bigger picture coming along as you start progressing in your career. So. Thank you. Hello. I, uh, my question comes purely out of curiosity because I'm not familiar with your industry at all. But uh, the, thank you. But the fact that uh, you've got prep time, does that come up just to, at the beginning of a production or does it come up every day? Or if it makes any sense, my question that is. It's at the beginning before you start, before you get on location and start shooting. Every day? No, before the, before the, before you start filming no. prior. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have, do we have more questions? Is somebody coming up there. They are. Hi. Um, hi, Jane. Hey, Crystal. <laughs> hi. Um, I had a question. Um, I do work on a lot of commercials um, as an AC for one particular DP. Um, and I find that with the pacing of commercials, I'm notified last minute, one of the job. And then two, um, they're always the, I guess, I don't know who does it, but somebody already pre purchases the camera uh, package. So how do you go about um, when you get into prep and you see like you're missing this or you need to add more batteries or more cars or more whatever items, but then you're, there's also budgetary concerns where the, the production company might not want to pay for it, um, but you know you need it and it's kind of last minute and you're, you're just now like finding out everything that you need to do. You you, you bring up something which is really good, and this is uh, I, this is one of my favorite things because this happens in the future world too. You usually the the rental house that you're going through, the facility you're going to prep this package is going to have a list of what was ordered, and you're going to look at it and you're going to know that it's going to need more, or, and so just add it on. And the reality is, is you can always talk to whoever's shooting like the, the minute, um, of what can or can't be dropped. But if you know there's something that's specifically needed, just add it on. And then that becomes an issue now with production and a rental house to figure out what the actual cost is. And then it's up to them to decide how big the discount's going to be or how much they're actually willing to pay. What you're, what you're discussing, what you're talking about right now is very interesting because it does happen in the future world where on your last day where you're checking out all your gear all of a sudden you get this phone call and it's just like hey what do i what do you need all this stuff for this is way too much money we don't have this money in the budget and then now you've got to talk to the director of photography and say hey this is what's going on what can we drop and then 
It's just like, what can we move to another package? What can we, but that's in the future world. You, you can move things around to a day player list and still take it with you. But yeah, you're, what's happening with you and that when you know you need something more, add it. Let the production deal with the rental house as far as what the actual cost is gonna be. So I hope that helps. Okay, and then just one other quick question. How do you convince them to get your second AC into prep? Because I often don't have my second AC with me there. It's the same thing I always, I keep saying with cause and effect. I send a long email about all the issues that are going to come about by not bringing me on the rest of my team. So I just keep explaining this reason why if not, just expect them to break down. I couldn't really hear you. You were breaking up a lot. Oh. Sure. It was, it was breaking up. I couldn't really hear you. Yeah, Asia, you have some bandwidth now? stuff going on. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Oh. All right. I, I was saying the same thing as earlier. I was saying how um, just to give a cause and effect, again, just to, to, to explain to the person production that without them it's going to cause uh this this and this that it will cause delays because they're not allowed they're not being allowed to do the job they need to do, do the day before so it's going to cause delay on the day of the job and just be very specific and say this is what it is that's going to Hello. Um, so my question is related to uh, potential gaps between prep time and first day on set. And I just wanted to know kind of when you arrive in the morning, first day of filming, what exactly needs to happen to sort of confirm that everything that you cleared in prep actually occurs in the same way once you're on set that first day? Like, I, I, how much time should be devoted to that? Um, in features in episodic, they usually give you an 18 minute pre-call to, uh, to put the gear together uh, for your daily usage. Commercials, I know that doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes it's like you show up at call and then you've got to take everything out of the boxes and put it back together and make it work. Um, this is a terrible thing to say, but you have to do what's within the limitations of production because I have, I, if you get on a job and they say, we want you there at 8 a.m. and you show up at 8 a.m. and they want to start shooting and the camera's not built, I have to say tough, tough luck. You, you, you're given, that's the amount of time that you're given to build, start doing your package of putting it together. You need to realize that any time you put in before the time you're on the clock, if you get injured, if something happens to you, that's on you. It's not on production. So let's say you fall off, you, you're unloading a truck, you fall off the gate and you break your arm. Production's not responsible for your injury. If you're supposed to be there at eight o'clock and you're unloading a truck and you fall off and you break your arm, well then production's responsible. So if they want a camera at a specific time, you're gonna to have to ask them to give you a, a pre-call prior to that in order to help build a camera to get it to the way it was when you actually walked out of the rental house, if that makes sense to you. Sure. And just one quick uh, second question, which is, um, I'm actually about to shoot a one day shoot. Uh, so exactly what is a non-negotiable in terms of prep? I guess that's a question for all of you. Like, what would you consider to be a non-negotiable? Cannot be taken out of prep, no matter how small the, the shoot is. I, I would think for me, and this is, you know, I'm speaking as someone who does a lot of one-day and two-day commercials. 
I typically, if there is no prep, I tell them that they have to, it's on them to deal with any delays or downtime at the beginning of the shoot day because there was not adequate prep to be up and running. Um, exactly what Larry said, it's, and Asia and I had this exact same thing happen. We got onto a production and they wanted to know why the cameras weren't up and making picture at call. And we had to explain to them that you kind of have to turn everything up on and hook it all up and get all the receivers and senders. And the for DITs, it's often a deal where they're trying to cut overtime at the end and they will bring you in late, even on a shoot where you haven't had a prep day and you are struggling to, to catch up and keep up before it starts shooting. And you need to make them aware when you get into the negotiating that deal with the producer, that they are, if they're willing to take the risk, you lay out the risks for them, this and this and this could happen, and you need to be prepared for that. And, you know, sometimes they are, and sometimes they say, no, we just don't have the money. We need to bring you in later. All right. Um, if it's all right with you guys, maybe we can squeeze in one more quick question and answer. Um, I do believe we have a question. informative panel and Michael this is Carolyn Jardine under the mask um, ah. how are hi you? Carolyn okay um, I I just want sorry I can barely see um, I just wanted to ask if you um, don't mind do you have a message for the guild members in the audience uh, regarding the uh, this coming week's uh, strike authorization vote and thanks uh, uh, let me let me take over on that, and that is really not a subject for uh, this panel. Um, uh, you know, that's there. There's a lot of activity going on with that, and um, uh, all I can say is follow follow the news releases, uh, follow the dialogues in social media. So anyhow, I guess um, that starts to uh, uh, bring us up to uh, the close of our time. Uh, I appreciate everyone having been there. Uh, you know, I, I hope you uh, enjoyed our our conversation. And uh, Jane, Larry, Aaron, Asia, um, thank you very much. We appreciate your Saturday morning. My Thank pleasure. you. Thank I you. just, I just wish there was more time to field more questions. That's all. Right. Yeah. I could keep. Yeah. Talking. Well, if we do have time for more questions, we'll take it. But that's gonna. That's that's up to our handlers here. Hi, unfortunately, we do have to um, transition to our next panel, but thank you so much, everyone, um, both everyone here in the audience and everyone who joined as a panelist. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks yep. for having me. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you.